welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Edinger and Brian Brew, and today we're revisiting a topic that we've touched on several times. Um, in fact, as Greg was pointing out earlier, it's kind of implicit in the title of our podcast, Halting Towards Zion. We're talking about the city of God, um, and the reason we've talked about it so many times is that it's a theme in scripture and it shows up a lot. So it seems only fair. Um, so today our source is Isaiah 60. And we've added some more layers to the sandwich, if you will, so that this time when we add more cheese, it's on top of the other meat and lettuce. And this analogy isn't really working, is it? <laughs> um, anyway, Bearing in mind everything that we've talked about recently, especially the suffering servant and the the Messiah in the Old Testament, what does Isaiah 60 tell us about the city of God? As I was saying earlier, one of the marks of of 20th century America and probably 21st century America as well, is our tendency to reduce salvation down to the purely personal. Mm -hmm. Uh, Is Jesus your personal savior? Now, he ought to be. That's true. But oddly enough, the Bible never uses that kind of language as prevalent as it was in 20th century Christendom. And when God first preaches the gospel to Abraham, he uses the words, in thee shall all nations be blessed. God's a covenant-keeping God. He lays hold of individuals, but in laying hold of them, he reckons with all the covenant connections in which they already exist marriage, children, community, nations. And more than that, having done so, he then plants them in a new community. The New Testament calls it the church. The Old Testament called it a number of things, Israel for one. But as the prophets look forward beyond historic Israel, they used words like Zion and Jerusalem and the city of God and the mountain of the Lord and things like that that tell us that all along God's goal was not simply to to save random individuals unrelated to one another who might eventually run into each other in heaven. Hey, Bob, didn't I know you on earth? <laughs> yeah, I just ran into Mary. Wasn't she your wife? I don't know. I haven't looked her up yet. You know, that's kind of what some people, I think, if you pressed them, would Think of heaven, but it's not natural. Normally, working with teenagers, normally the questions are like, "Well, I know my family. Will my friends be there? Well, I know my friends. Well, I, I I've been told that you're 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 so changed that you won't know anybody. You'd be like everybody's strangers to you. Like, no, no, <laughs> that's, no, no. I don't. I'm not quite sure where they're getting at. But so we want to look at this one particular passage. Yes, it comes well after the suffering servant. So. In the flow of the narrative, the child was born back in seven, chapter 7 and chapter 8. And he, we, we get a little more about him as we go along through the chapters until finally he's introduced as the suffering servant, the one who dies for the sins of God's people, and then implied, rises again, mm-hmm. and invites everyone to come to the waters and drink and to buy them without money and without price. And now we're a little bit beyond that, and we the prophet draws, draws back, or the Holy Spirit does, and shows us something of the fruition of all of that. So the Messiah died, suffered horribly, died, rose again. What's the fruit of that? Did Jesus... We, we can look at this two ways, as I've already suggested. We can look at it in sheer numbers. Did Jesus die so that after, say, 144,000 or 144 million or whatever, people have been saved, as long as we got one from pretty much every nation, that that's, that's God will be satisfied with that. In the middle of Isaiah 53, we're told the Messiah shall see his seed. And the writer of Hebrews says something similar. For the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame. And the question has to be, how big was Jesus', was Jesus vision? the joy of how many saved. Now, the Bible, strictly speaking, doesn't say. In fact, it it it, it so it so strongly doesn't say that it says it's a great multitude that no man can number. That's <laughs> <clears throat> it mentions numbers only to only to disclaim them and say, yeah, it's 
at, at, pick a number you like and go higher and you're still not there. It's it's an incredibly huge number. But also the other thing um, is he is the work of Jesus limited to stray individuals who may go to these Bible clubs called churches now and then because that's what religious people do. You know, stamp collectors go to stamp collector meetings and Boy Scouts to go to Boy Scout meetings and Christians go to church meetings because you're probably going to run into somebody who kind of believes what you do and does religious stuff like you. Is, is that it? Is that the extent of what Jesus is doing? And this passage, to some degree, answers both of those questions. Now, before we go on, something from last time that I, I don't want to belabor, but I'm going to mention it. Uh, commentators have looked at this passage in Isaiah 60 and have said, well, that's really glorious and wonderful, and it, it just uh, seems almost ideal. So um, it's either heaven or it's eternity. Oh, why would we say that? Well, because nothing like that could ever happen here. Who's... Whose possibilities are we limiting here? Are we saying that God has explicitly told us he won't do this? Has he explicitly said, oh, this is only for heaven, this is only for eternity? Or are we reading in our own presuppositions about what God can and cannot do, what he will and will not do, and, and using that as a hermeneutic to shape what the text says? So as we go along, I just want to note some of the things that the prophet says some of them, well, uh, is this the city of God? Yes. Is its, is its final realization beyond eternity and the rest, or beyond time and redemptive history, I should say, to be more accurate, and beyond the resurrection? Of course. All of God's blessings find their fruition in eternity. For the soul who departs this life and goes to be with Jesus, they, there's a, a high increase in God's blessings at that point as we're <laughs> freed from sin and get to see Jesus face to face and hang out with God's people. But the question is, is that what this is primarily about? Or are we to say, well, this is what he promises within history. And you can try to imagine how much better it gets afterward, but don't break your brain in the process. <laughs> um, so notice how it starts. Um, Arise, shine. For thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and Gentiles shall come to thy light, kings, to the brightness of thy rising. There is no exact time indicator here. He does not say in the last days, as he said in, in Isaiah 2 and Matthew 4. But he does give us some, some circumstances. It's, it's been dark. It's covered the earth. It's covered the peoples. And then God appears in light, and when he does, Gentiles come to the light, and that includes the kings. The problem with this being heaven is there was never any darkness in heaven. <laughs> Beyond the resurrection, there's, there's never any darkness. This is about people who have been in darkness coming to the light. This and this sounds the, familiar, right? This is it the, those who dwelt in darkness have seen mm -hmm. a great light. Uh, Upon Galilee them, of the Gentiles. Yeah, those upon whom, um, I forget the rest, upon them hath the, the light shined. Yeah, he's quoting himself pretty much um, from chapter 9. And we know from Matthew that that has a particular fulfillment. <laughs> yeah, a particular fulfillment. This, this was Jesus in his Galilean ministry. Jesus is Yahweh come into earth, which was dark. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared. <laughs> We wouldn't take the rest of that song as <laughs> good interpretation of it. <laughs> we won't uh, nitpick right now. <laughs> I can't remember the rest of it. Uh, <laughs> weary world rejoices. Well, that's kind of what is going on here, because when the light comes, there is a response, and it's a response from the Gentiles. So we're not in the Old Covenant, because in the Old Covenant, although there were times when there were Gentile converts, and in a couple of occasions, a large number we can think of Nineveh's conversion at the preaching of Jonah. We can think of all the all those uh, within the Persian Empire who became Jews, the text says, uh, in the days of Mordecai and Esther. But by and large, there were not large flocks of Gentiles coming to join Israel or coming to the temple. Solomon, again, lots of people came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. But 
that's not this. This those were all forerunners and and anticipations, but this is something much bigger. And yes, Isaiah has already told us about it. The person of the 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 one who will be the light of the world, who will be the child who is born, the son who's given, the one who will be the virgin born Emmanuel. So we th this is the context we should expect this to be. And then the prophet says, lift up thine eyes round about and see. All they gather themselves together, they come to thee. Thy son shall come from far and thy daughter shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together and thine heart shall fear and be enlarged because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. The forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. So this is directed to this city. Yes, we haven't really even been told it's a city yet. He's talking to somebody who, at this moment, we're seeing things from that person's point of view. This person is looking out over the world as light dawns around them, and then out of the darkness comes streaming these Gentiles, led by their kings, and bringing people with them, whom, prophet says, those, those, the, 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 those young folk over there, those are, those are some of your daughters, there's a daughter, there's a, oh, and there's some sons. They're, they're bringing them from very far away as the darkness begins to lift. Now, if we were good Armenians, which we're not, we could say, oh, they heard about Jesus from far away and of their own free will, they're coming to the light. If there were nothing else in the Bible, you could do that with this. But of course, what we're talking about here is the response of the sinner to the light of the gospel. The light of the gospel penetrates the darkness. Um, turn them from dark, open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, Paul was told. I've given thee a light for the Gentiles. Paul, again, quoting prophecies from Isaiah about Jesus. So these, these are constant images throughout the Old and New Testament. And the question, of course, at some point is, wait, who, who, who's he talking to? Um, the glory of the Lord has risen upon thee, it's singular, not ye, but thee. So this, we're seeing a, in the vision a person looking out in the darkness and seeing all of these come. And they're bringing with them treasures, the abundance of the sea, the forces of the Gentiles, verse 6. The multitude of camels shall cover thee, the dromedaries of Midian and Ephah. All they from Sheba shall come, and they shall bring gold and incense. The psalmist in Psalm 72 uses similar language. They shall bring gold and incense, and they shall show forth the praises of the Lord. So as these Gentile peoples are coming to our subject here, they're bringing treasure with them of all sorts, whatever is unique to their land, to their people, to their geography. They're bringing gold, incense, camels, whatever. Flocks of Kedar shall be gathered together unto thee. The rams of Naboth shall minister unto thee. They shall come up with acceptance on mine altar, and I will glorify the house of my glory. So God's going to God's going to. They're bringing this stuff. And it might be easy to say, well, these are pagans bringing their treasures. What do we need with that? Um, treasure's pretty useful. Treasure's pretty useful, yeah. Especially when it's things like, I, I don't know, the microchip and painless dentistry <laughs> and antibiotics, uh, internal combustion engine, although that's not in favor right now. <laughs> but, you know, there's there are a lot of treasures, both just in terms of money and, and such. But there are there's technology, there's art. There's literature, there's all kinds of things that the Gentiles bring, and much of it can be used to adorn the subject whose name we still don't have for, uh, we don't have a name for. Who are these that fly as a cloud and as doves to their windows? Surely the isles shall wait for me, and the ships of Tarshish at the ends of the earth, to bring thy sons from far, their silver and their gold with them, unto the name of the Lord thy God, and to the Holy One of Israel, because he hath glorified thee. So, again, people from the ends of the earth are coming. This is not just the local um, Mideastern nations that are responding. As far as their geographic knowledge reaches, people are coming and bringing treasure with them. But they're bringing it for God's sake. It's not because our subject is so great and wonderful, although she is shining and admitting light. But it's all about God. 
God's God's the reason they're coming, and God's the one. And how, how did she get so shiny? God hath glorified thee. The sons of strangers shall build up thy walls, and their kings shall minister unto thee. For in my wrath I smote thee, and in my favor I have had mercy on thee. And that's a huge hint as to who this person is, because if we go back to the sections that follow the suffering servant, 54 and on, uh, we have run into this woman before. Mm -hmm. She is Yahweh's bride. Uh, she has, she in her unfaithfulness uh, ran off. God, God chastened her. And yet God has promised to bring her back and to give her more children than she ever had. She's going to lose the children she has now, but he's going to supply children from everywhere. And in, in earlier passages, she says, wait, where? I've been by myself. Where all these children come from? I'm going to call for the Gentiles. So these are adopted children, covenant children, children brought in by God's grace, but rec she recognizes them as, as hers. Uh, God has chastened her. In my wrath, I smote thee, but in my favor... Have I had mercy on thee? Therefore, thy gates shall be open continually. This woman has gates. This woman has gates. Wait, so she's a woman, but she's a city. Wait a second. Wait a second. Haven't we heard and seen that before? And aren't we going to hear and see it again before the book's over? And the gates open. Hmm. That's a description of the New Jerusalem in Revelation 21. The gates are open day and night. Why? So people can come in. <laughs> Uh, both here and in Revelation 21, the city has walls, really high, powerful walls. And yet the gates are always open. The metaphor is mixed, obviously. Mm -hmm. On the one hand, she is protected by God himself, by his salvation. And but no yet, one's accosting her. No one's accosting her. In fact, people are flowing through the gates. Now, in other images looked at in different ways, of course she has enemies. And they're going to be mentioned in a little bit. But that's not the focus here. The focus is that as her light goes out, people come and they come in and they become part of the city and they bring their treasures with them, whatever. Again, and I, I think this is important, whatever is particular to them. It's not limited. Well, just bring your gold or just bring your silver or just bring, bring your <laughs> precious metals. Uh, you guys have incense. You guys got goats. You guys got camels. You guys do have gold. Bring the gold. We don't, we're not <laughs> going to disdain the gold. But every nation, according to what it has, what it trades in, is going to bring this to enhance this woman, this city. The gate shall not be shut day or night, and it was not a guess on our part, that the men may that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. Uh, it, it, he keeps saying that. Mm -hmm. And they are kings as kings. It's not just... Well, look at all these people who are flowing in. There's a mailman, and there's a garbage collector, and there's an engineer, and there's a doctor. Oh, look, there's a king, and there's a, a housewife. It's not just that among we, – we don't get a list of all the other kinds of people who are here. The, the, the sense is lots of people of all different sorts are here. And then he goes out of the way to mention kings, repeat it. Um, they come as kings. That is, they come into the city of God, into Christ's kingdom, in their ruling position – and that means that God's going to require some things of them. Now, really fast, you have to run ahead and jump. Does that mean that the church is going to force religion on the state? No, it's not. That's not the only <laughs> option. No. We yeah. are so politically minded that mm -hmm. you mentioned some, even the weakest connection between church and state, and people go, um, what is the word? Bonkers. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> There's there's a knee jerk reaction, yeah, and on the is. flip side, there's the uh, sort of newfangled Christian anarchist perspective oh. that says that well, the nation is it's an artificial construct anyway. No, not in the Bible. Not yeah, yeah. not in the Bible. <laughs> but God deals with nations as nations, and when the kings, when the the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our God and of his Christ, their kingdoms, they still exist yeah. as a concept. Yeah, he doesn't yeah. legally dissolve We're, them. Um, we affirm against both tyrants and Anabaptists. But, yeah. And I repeat <laughs> myself. There you go. There you go. We, uh, or to put it differently, both sides of the Anabaptist spectrum. Because mm -hmm. some ah, of the yes. Anabaptists yeah. did go and take over cities and didn't institute God's laws. They instituted their own, which they thought were cooler. Yeah. 
<laughs> until finally both the reformers and the Roman Catholics got on their case. And you know, yeah, it was together. Not, it was yeah, one together. of the few times where they could agree. Oh, okay. These people are a problem. Yeah. yeah. On oh, that point, as, a, as an aside, a mm-hmm. uh, really interesting thing was somebody talked about some some historian theologian on Twitter talked about <laughs> how um, the Reformation was largely successful because uh, you had the reformers and the Catholics against each other, but more importantly, against a third shared enemy, the Anabaptists. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, we it can... gave it gave the reformers something to say, like we are against you, and just so you're aware, we're on your side. That we're not that. Yeah, we're not that. Yeah, we are not that. Let us yeah. distinguish ourselves. We can uh, footnote and say, go listen to the Dan Carlin hardcore history about the. It's what's no the longer name free. Just to clarify, oh, bummer. It's that not been free really for good. a while. Oh. Uh, it's called uh, Prophets of Doom. Prophets of Doom. Yeah, it's a long podcast it's episode. Long. He's known for long episodes. Yeah. He's just telling the story of the Anabaptist siege of okay, Munster. Okay, that's what I was going to yeah. ask. In Munster. I heard, I heard it, but that's, yeah. Oh, in Munster? Okay, yeah. that would be yeah. worth listening to. It, it is. So, so what we're describing <laughs> is not that. Right. Just saying that up front, not that. But there's the other side of the Anabaptist movement, which became, which turned very inward mm-hmm. and uh, had certain Gnostic tendencies. Wait. Oh, that was a sad ring. Let me ring that again. <laughs> Oh, why is it gross? <laughs> that was our there we go. There, there we, we go. go. Okay. The Gnostic bell has Yeah, been in that it reforged. turned its back on um, culture and society and upon politics in particular and retreated into their own private corners and often into their own private hearts. Mm-hmm. And, and there, there's a, a consistency here in the history of Christianity. These, these are the two... What's the Greek phrase between Scylla and Charybdis? Yeah, thank you. On the one hand, <laughs> the rock in the hard place. The rock in the hard place. <laughs> hard to pronounce. <laughs> the, the the frying pan and the fire. We do not want the state to come in and be more than the state is ordained by by God to be. It can't evangelize. It does a rotten job. It draws the sword and. Christianity becomes something other than Christianity. So no to that. That's not what we're talking about. On the other hand, to say that Christianity is this private affair that never touches political matters or economic matters or finance or wealth or whatever, health, education, welfare, that's not the solution. Either. There is something in between which God marvelously orchestrates being infinitely wise in all that so that he, if we will read the words of Scripture and heed them, we will walk between the two. We will recognize that kings ought to recognize Jesus as their Lord and that there are moral principles in Scripture that they ought to implement that do not involve forcing people to be Christians and that do not involve slaying every sinner who pokes his head up out of the earth. They involve maintaining justice and peace so the church can do her work. And on the other hand, we have to say no to people who are ashamed to take their Christianity out into the public square, into the marketplace, or to the voting booth, or to the court system. And we have to say, no, God does have things there. And you you may exceed us sometimes in your personal piety, but you're 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 leaving an awful lot of ground that Jesus claims and surrendering it to the enemy. And and, and so this chapter keeps coming back to this theme. That, that nations are coming, and with them, their kings. That is their political and legal structure. The gospel will change these things. The goal is not to make every nation look like Israel, but the, the goal is to have every king, president, parliament, judge, magistrate, mayor, dog catcher, acknowledge that Jesus is Lord, trust him for the salvation of his own soul, and then submit to his word in the ordinary affairs of life, loving God and loving his neighbor and doing the practical things that the Bible says you should do, if that's who you are, and doing them not simply as a person, as a lone individual, but doing them as a president, a dog catcher, or whatever. Um, Just as he says the same thing to engineers and teachers and doctors and librarians and uh, tree cutters and whatever, it's the same thing for all of us. We are to bring who we are as whole persons 
and lay it before Christ, all of our treasures, all that we are, all that he's gifted us with, and thereby enrich the kingdom of God. Now, there's nobody in charge of this except Christ himself. Yahweh is the one who is orchestrating this. There's no human leader to whom we turn. There's no pope. There's no divine magistrate uh, who we need to set up so that we can get this done. This is something that comes as, as an automatic internal to external response as the light of the gospel pierces the darkness. The light changes us. We become children of the light. And so we run to the light, to borrow some lines from John 3. Uh, and then these things happen. Uh, we don't need to set up the state to make them happen for us. That's dangerous. And I think this idea of us as whole persons mm -hmm. serving the kingdom of God, serving Jesus, is so important and so freeing. Because the alternative is I have my Christian hat and I have my mm -hmm. engineer hat, which means that my engineering is somehow cut off from Christ, which would mean it's not as good as whatever I'm doing when I'm wearing my Christian hat, right? Because Jesus yeah. is the most important. Um, so why would we put on that second hat at all? You know, but if our engineer hat is also Christian, <laughs> like it, it's, it leads to all of life being worship, which leads us to enjoy the life that God has given to us to live. Exactly. We don't have to partition our soul off in different ways. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I think there are a lot of Christians, if you explained it to them that way, they would say, yeah, that. But sometimes our theological terms and schema and paradigms get in the way. And we say, well, that sounds good. But what we really mean is, okay, stop. We don't want to, you know, that, that was, that was good. That was, that was clear. And I think the average Christian could follow what you just said, Emily, and, and do something with it. Here's, here is some more. Um, verse 12, for the nation and kingdom that will not serve thee shall perish. Now, what it does not say is that Zion's going to go out and attack those other kingdoms <laughs> with nuclear weapons and blow them up. That's, that's how will they perish? Because God will withdraw his mercies and set his judgment, and Christ sitting on the throne will take his rod of iron and smack him. And they will either, they. it doesn't mean that every one of them necessarily is going to die. It means they will cease to exist in that political form, and Jesus will keep stirring the pot until they're ready to turn to him. Some will die in wars and plagues. Some will survive. And you can look at any spot in the world, and most spots have undergone radical changes of government more times than anybody can count. And and Jesus will keep, to borrow a line from Ezekiel, overturn, overturn, overturn it until he comes whose right it is to reign. Uh, the glory of Lebanon shall come unto thee. Those are cedars. The fir tree, the pine tree, and the box tree together to beautify the place of my sanctuary. So Zion is also... God's temple, it's a place where God is and ought to be worshipped. I will make the place of my feet glorious, the sons also of them that afflicted. See, there were, there were enemies. And again, this is one metaphor, one parable of the kingdom of God. And in others, the, there would be a stronger emphasis upon the warfare. But this, this is not the warfare um, paradigm. This is, this is the, here's a city and here everyone's coming to it, much like Micah 4 from last time. So there were enemies, and, and oddly enough, the sons of the persecutors are the very persons coming and bowing down. And all they that despise thee shall bow themselves down at the soles of thy feet. Uh, it, is, it is easy as Christians and Americans to perhaps to look at the bad guys and say, they're bad guys. <laughs> like we okay. should pray that God will, if we do anything at all, we tend to, God, we pray that God will judge them. You know, early, in earlier generations of Americans, perhaps the, the, the opposite extreme, oh, we should pray that they know Jesus. Yeah, actually, you know, we should. Um, because that's what Isaiah is promising. That the mm -hmm. bad guys, a lot of them and their children, are going to come over to our side. Doesn't say when, doesn't say how. But since God's promised it, it's a thing to pray for. And they will call thee. The city of, there we have it finally. Who is this person? This They will call thee the city of the Lord, the Zion 
of the Holy One of Israel. So all this time we've been reading about that city that the prophets in the Psalms called Zion. It's the city of the Lord. It's It appears under the image of a, of a, a woman, once deserted, now overflowing with children. It appears as a city into which the whole world can fit in due time. Whereas thou hast been forsaken and hated, forsaken of the Lord and hated by men, so that no man went through thee, I will make thee an eternal excellency, a joy of many generations. So this again is God. This is not some utopian social gospel where if the church does X, Y, and Z, utopia will arrive. This is God's grace through his gospel, through his light, calling the world and people responding because God has the sovereign power to do that, it's called effectual calling, regeneration, monergism. And thou shalt also suck the milk of the Gentiles, and shall suck the breasts of kings. There's kings again. They just keep bringing kings in. And thou shalt know that I, the Lord, am thy Savior and thy Redeemer, the Mighty One of Jacob. And so this is all proof that God really does save. He doesn't just save a few people here and there. He's, he's saving nations, covenanted communities. For brass I will bring gold, and for iron I will bring silver, and for wood brass, and for stones iron. I will also make the officers peace, and the exactors righteousness. So we're dealing in moral qualities, and in, in godly graces and virtues. Violence shall no more be heard in thy land, wasting nor destruction within thy borders, but thou shalt call thy walls, see she has walls, salvation, and thy gates praise. At this point, in case we miss it, we should figure out that this is not a literal city <laughs> of concrete and steel and asphalt. Um, this this is a community. This is the covenant of the community. This is God's people as they worship and serve in this world. Uh, the sun shall no more be thy light by day, neither f uh, for brightness, the moon, to give light unto thee. But the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, and thy God thy glory. This is what Jesus said, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of light. In New Jerusalem in Revelation 21 and 22, much the same thing is said. Thy God, the Lord shall be unto thee an everlasting light, thy God thy glory. The sun shall no more go down, <clears throat> neither the moon, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself. Let's Wait, is there no moon or is there a moon? If we try to take it literally, <laughs> we run into a contradiction. When we understand the point, the point is you're going to have light all the time, both directly from God himself, because we all have, again, the personal relationship with Christ, and he reveals himself in his word. Uh, but there are also these ordinances and institutions that he's put in our world, church primarily, and family, that bear his light, <clears throat> as the sun and moon did in the original creation, and so they're going to be there. The, the, the institutions that he has put here for us to depend on, he's not going to lose. The church is not going to perish from the earth. Churches are not going to perish from the earth. God will always have institutions and anointed servants to declare his word and to worship him. There's something um, that I've, I've seen quoted quite a lot lately, and this is a positive quote. It is, grace does not destroy nature, but it does perfect it. <laughs> and that is very much kind of the image we're seeing is that, that yes the gospel comes and there are natural things that are broken and dysfunctional uh most blatantly obvious that i think all the reformed would agree with is the image of god in man is deformed because of sin mm -hmm. and grace comes and restores it it does not destroy it and, and give you something that is completely different it gives you a yeah new thing that is a restoration of what was and it's more glorious and so like you're saying nature has these institutions of god there's you know there's marriage as as a, a creation ordinance there's the state there's the church there's the family these things don't just get thrown into the blender and dispersed to the four winds <laughs> it's each of them is restored in their own functions to something greater. And Abraham Kuyper would be saying amen. Uh, the, the quote, of course, that you gave us, nature, grace is not uh, eradicate nature, but perfects it, is from Thomas Aquinas. 
Mm-hmm. Just I'm just I'm pointing that out in case anyone says, wait. Do they know they're talking? They're quoting Aquinas? Yeah, that sounds very... <laughs> oh, I very uh, yeah, self-consciously <laughs> am aware of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. we, we, we know that. And mm-hmm. um, no, we're, we're, we're not um, Thomas in our theology. But occasionally, if you look at something that, that, that people say and you've disdained it long enough, you know, sometimes you turn around and look at it from a different angle. There are ways <laughs> it can be very true. Yeah. And taken in that sense, absolutely. That is mm-hmm. exactly the truth of the matter. Unfortunately, far too many have taken it to mean that in perfecting it, they 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 actually do mean destroying it, turning it into something wholly different from what it is, pulling man out of nature into into um, the realm of grace, which is not biblical. But it's also not exactly what that quote says in any case. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like every time I'm, I read Thomas Jefferson, I'm like. Oh, dang it. I hate it when he's right. <laughs> <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and a lot of times he was because of the culture he grew up in. I remember yeah. there's a there's an Onion article that every once in a while gets shared. This is the screenshot of the title and it says, Heartbreaking, Man You Hate is Correct. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I've been in those situations where you, what, you someone start you start arguing with someone about something, and and someone you don't trust jumps in as an on your side. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what I think of this. Should I be thankful that you understand what's going on here? Or should I be worried that maybe I don't? <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. This, thy sun shall no more go down, neither shall thy moon withdraw itself, for the Lord shall be thy everlasting light. And the days of thy mourning shall be ended. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them, nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall lead, feed them and lead them to the living fountains of waters. And God will wipe away all tears from their eyes. Revelation on that great multitude which no man can number. Thy people also shall be all righteous. Ha! Huh, I wonder what doctrine that is. <laughs> They shall inherit the land forever, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I may be glorified. None of this is all about us. It's not so that we can have an easy, happy life, um, that we can have everything we want, that our world will be at peace and experience prosperity. Those are side things. The primary thing, the chief end of God, is to glorify God and enjoy Mm -hmm. himself forever. A little one shall become a thousand, a small one, a strong nation, I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. And we're not going there right now, but the next chapter opens with the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. So I I think perhaps that having seen that, we walk away or turn our backs and say, wait, this is incredible. How could the, no man could do this. That's the point. (laughs) (laughs) Or more accurately, one man. (laughs) man And so in the next chapter, the Messiah says, the spirit of the Lord God is upon me. How is this possible? That. Because God, because Jesus has received the Holy Spirit without measure, and we return once again. We The, the prophet never get, lets us get far from Jesus. And every time he shows us something marvelous, seemingly miraculous, seemingly un- inconceivable, <laughs> he immediately brings us back, how is that possible? Jesus. It's all about Jesus. And if we want to change the world, if we want this kind of worldwide community where all nations are rushing to serve and worship our God in Christ and receive his righteousness, then it's to Jesus we have to point them. Uh, Sure, there's some legislation we need now and then, and there's some educational institutions we probably should build, and some things we should probably see get off the air eventually, but that's all, that's clean up, that's et cetera, et cetera. The heart of the matter is that people need to know Jesus. And until that happens, all that other stuff is is at best waving away the vultures that gnaw on a rotting culture. We need resurrection, and anything short of that will not do. Well, in, in summary, to, to draw us back, so again, God shows us a community. It's a worldwide community. All the, the ethnic and geographical uh, linguistic barriers are down. People are united in the worship of God and uh, their service to God. They're they're dedicating their culture, their treasures, their civilization to God. And this is the work of God. And this is not a social gospel. The time frame, 
God will hasten it. But you know the thing about <laughs> Aslan? <laughs> <laughs> he calls all time soon, yes, which is does. very frustrating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we want things sped up. Um, mm -hmm. 2,000 years from Jesus' ascension to here. And it, we would be idiots not to see the progress of the church and of the mm -hmm. gospel and the corresponding positive changes in our culture. But we got a long way to go. We, 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 we don't need to put on rosy glasses and ignore the two world wars of the last century, of the various police actions and the little minor wars that followed the 70-year the 70 -year reign of the Soviet Union and the decline of American culture and morality. Those are all real things. And they're probably not going to go away right away. They're things we have to wrestle with. But the solution, still and always, is to point people to Jesus. And while we do that, we need to remember that we're not simply offering them a one-way personal, uh, you get your own coach and no one will be there, ticket to heaven. But we're offering them a part in a body, a, a, a mm -hmm. citizenship and a huge city that's not like Los Angeles or San Francisco where nobody <laughs> knows your name, but it's like those old communities. It's like Cheers. Where, it's like Cheers where everybody knows your <laughs> yeah. name. People are going to be there that you know and love. They're going to be there mm -hmm. for you. That's what we're building. Um, what Which is, is why the show Cheers had such wonderful yeah, success. <laughs> it, it appealed to something in us yeah. that said this is how it ought to be. And far too, far too often Christianity hasn't been that. Mm -hmm. Church becomes either my shot in the arm to be more religious for the week or where I get to show off my religiosity or when I get to go through things that define me as being a religious or spiritual person rather than a community living out life together at the very center of life worship. Mm -hmm. So and sometimes we, it's all three of those first ones at once. <laughs> yeah. So there there's much for us. It's not that Christians don't believe these things. It's just that we so easily forget and de-emphasize. Uh, the book you've reminded us of more than once, Emily, the, the gospel comes with... Uh, with the house key. With the house key. Could you just remind us a little bit about that right now? Um, I think Brian is actually the one who brings this up because I've only read the first chapter. So. Oh, okay. Well, <laughs> is it you? I think I have, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I don't remember how many times I've brought it up, but, but what's, uh, it what's is... What's the basic theme and, and idea? The basic idea, so Rosaria Butterfield was a liberal college professor in a lesbian relationship and met Jesus uh, through the friendship of an RPCNA church plant. And I believe it was the pastor who directly mm -hmm. interacted with her. But her basic idea is that one of the reasons that people in the LGBTQ community are so uh, the reason why there is a community in the first place is that they see other people like them get, you know, in their words, uh, shunted off, rejected mm -hmm. by the rest of society. And they say, all right, you're under our wing now. And everybody rallies around this one person that's new to the group and helps them. And so her whole mindset is that's actually something that the that community has that reflects Christ. Yeah. It reflects the the kind of community that the church should be. And so when you give the gospel to somebody, uh when you when you are approaching them even as an evangelizer, they're not a Christian yet, that gospel you give them comes with a house key. Yeah. That you are supposed to say, "My house is open to you because I want you to be part of my family." And you know, you're you're gonna be part of my friend circle, my family circle on Earth now, and that's why you get the the this um, you get this house key along with the, the the presentation. But also, more ultimately, we want you to be part of the ultimate family, which is in Christ only. Yeah, the emphasis that it begins now is terribly yes. important in this age. I mean, people don't care about doctrine. And don't care about morality. What what hooks do we have left when we have what the early church had? Love. See how they love one another, mm -hmm. and see how they love us. If we don't do that, does, does that mean we give in to everything they want and buy into their? No, of course not. But there are ways to be sweet and winsome and polite and kind and loving and still say, 
here's a line that draw that God draws. We'd like you to be on this side with us because we love you and because it's good for you and because there's joy here. But if there's no joy, if we're just a bunch of of critical <laughs> creeps, then why aren't they? What's going to move them? Oh, but it's the sovereign power of God in the gospel that saves people. Yes. Ever notice that God uses human situations mm -hmm. to make the gospel work? Jesus sat down with the woman in the well and talked to her like she was a real person. Mm -hmm. A couple or a chapter earlier, he sat down with Nicodemus and talked to him like it was a real theologian and pointed out <laughs> that it wasn't, but you know. Um, and, yeah, and so oddly on. enough, he sat down and talked to people. Yeah, he did. Mm -hmm. And he did not compromise his holiness by doing it. And he didn't rail upon the, the people he, railing is not the right word, but the, he spoke loudly against in very negative metaphors, were the religious people who thought that they were holy and perfect and upright and despised others. Everyone else, he talked to, even members of the Pharisaic party, they, you know what, they invited him to dinner? He came. <laughs> Whoa. So if a liberal churchman invites you over for dinner, you know what? This may be an opportunity. Or not. You never know. And that's the point. You do not know. And yes, it's yeah. the gospel that changes people's hearts, but God uses us as true humans with all our humanity to reach out to people. And if we fail in this, we're not going to have an audience. No one's going to listen. Um, and, and there's nothing here that's denying the sovereignty of God. He can, in fact, save someone out of the blue with when we're being complete idiots and spazzes. <laughs> but that's not the recommended way for it to happen, shall we say. It's not how it, Jesus behaved. It's kind of a, um, I guess you'd call it cringy, uh, phrase that gets overused. You know, we want God to show up <laughs> wherever something's going on where we, we want the gospel preached and it's... We can criticize that phrase all we want, but at the same time, a lot of the people who say that and are being cringy about it are the ones actually showing up and preaching the gospel. To people. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we should try to outdo them in that first before we <laughs> criticize the method necessarily. Yes, indeed. Well, earlier, I I don't want to take off without clarifying the shade that I threw earlier <laughs> on the hymn "O Holy Night." <laughs> <laughs> um, I I just did some quick Googling to find that the person who wrote it originally, the author of the French lyrics, I'm reading from classicfm.com. Mm. Again, quick Google. He was a wine merchant and poet, it says, and he was never particularly religious. So he's not even a Christian writing this poem. <laughs> um, and that was in 1843. And here's where my antenna always goes up when I hear the song, is that the person who translated it into English was Minister John Sullivan Dwight, who should sound familiar to you if you've studied Unitarianism and Transcendentalism. He's one of those. Oh. And I'll, I'll point out the third verse. Uh, Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Which is fine as far as it goes, right? Those are great, great biblical images. Um, but what decade would you guess that this was written in? Well, the slave is our brother. I'm going for the 1860s or 50s. 50s, 1850s. Yeah. So yeah. this is actually preaching a social gospel of that time. <laughs> <laughs> um, he means something very specific by those words, which is what always gets under my skin about it. So I, I mean, like I said, it's... Good. If you can separate it from that, I just can't. So, <laughs> but think of World War One and the truce and playing soccer and the tenor belting mm. out "Oh Holy Night" in the midst of the darkness. Anyway, I yeah. hear what you're saying. Yeah, I, I, I kept counterpoint on <laughs> is that uh, abolishing slavery rocks. So yeah, <laughs> there is. I think I it's mean, great. Fair. I think you should do it in your own country. <laughs> I, I'm going to get flack for that. Um, <laughs> but that's okay. That's why I'm on a podcast, right? <laughs> you don't yes. get to make a podcast without catching flack. And that's okay. Shall we have some positive recommendations before we go? Yes, let's. All right. That means you get to go first, Brian. That's fine. Um, I'm going to recommend a TV show that I watched as it came out. Uh, th this year is apparently Wait, did, the year. It's not the one I recommended okay. previously. <laughs> okay. 
Um, because I recommended Psych before because yes. I did the same thing. Apparently, this is the year of rewatching shows that I watched as a younger child or teenager and didn't understand much of. Mm-hmm. Um, so this one doesn't quite fall in that account. It's just it's just another show that I happen to watch. Um, called Warehouse Thirteen, mm. and it is about two Secret Service agents who encounter somebody um, while they're protecting the president at like uh, the Smithsonian Museum in DC. And uh, essentially, one of the museum workers pricks his finger on a Mayan statue of a head that has like crystalline teeth. And it basically activates it. It's an artifact. And it's starts possessing him and driving him to try and kill people at the museum. And anyway, they get wrapped up in this and they both get hired to work for the secretive government institution called warehouse 13. It is a giant warehouse in the middle of South Dakota with nothing around for miles. The nearest town is 300 people large and it's, you know, 20 minutes away. And the whole idea is, is a little bit, steampunk science fiction mysticality it's all it's all everything is hodgepodge it's all there anything you can imagine from like popular ideas of the universe uh it shows up so it's not it's not a christian show but essentially it houses all these artifacts from across history and the artifacts are like things that were around people and were basically imbued with something specific to them that they were obsessive about. So there's like a mirror that has um, Lewis Carroll's subject, Alice, stuck in it. Because Alice was actually a real historical person who murdered people, and then they wrote these like whimsical stories to cover it up. Um, (laughs) Ah. (laughs) And... Oh geez, I'm I'm forgetting a whole bunch of them, but basically it, that that's the conceit of the show. But what makes it fun is it's it's got really good character chemistry between the the leads and um just genuinely fun and lighthearted. So I remember watching it and just loving it, and I'm rewatching it. I I think I'm almost done with the first season at this point, and it's just it's the same feeling. I feel like it's just fun, wacky entertainment. So that's my recommendation. Cool. Emily? I'm going to recommend murder mystery parties. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I've been to one or two of these. I think they come in a kit. I, I've only been a guest. I haven't ever hosted one. But you, you, you're you assigned a character and you dress up and you, you find out who does Role it. playing? You role play it. <laughs> um, it's like acting and having dinner at the same time. But it's a lot of fun, even if you don't consider yourself a person who likes acting or anything. It's it's a mystery, and you get to be part of it, and it's fun. Yeah. Nice. I don't know why I thought of that. I, I feel like it is... Okay, here was my train of thought, and you can tell me if this is a valid train of thought. But, like, the, the community of the City of God mm-hmm. is an actual community. Mm-hmm. And when you have actual community, you have people who enjoy spending time together (laughs) and you bond. And this is a great way to bond with your fellow Christians. I mean, it's not as strong a bond as like worshiping the Lord together, but you know, (laughs) it's a thing you can do. You should also be friends with people. (laughs) Yeah, you should be friends with people. That's a good thing. In my short life, I have created two types of mystery games. I created one where I actually, I created the characters and I detailed 10 minutes by 10 minutes what they did the whole night from just before (laughs) the murder to the end. And of course, one of them says, congratulations, you're the murderer. Mm -hmm. And then they get to ask each other questions and try in turn, and they try to figure out what really happened and who's lying and who's kind of telling the truth and what the motives are. So that very organized. Mm -hmm. Uh, Much later in life, I came up with a, a more of a role-playing variation on it where I would just say, here's your character, here's some stuff you know, go have dinner and talk to people, <laughs> and if anybody shows you this symbol, you're dead, die, die dramatically. <laughs> and those were fun. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> along the lines of what, I, what I've what i done is the yeah. more uh, hands-off. 
Here's that does sound very fun. Yeah. yeah. It just we we've done, let's see, we did one on the uh I call the, the Titanic or some some mm. ship and sea monsters come. And we did <laughs> one in the old west and there are gold miners and ghosts, or mm. maybe there are, we're never sure. Mm-hmm. Um, I forget all that we 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 did three or four a long time ago, and our friend Joseph Rose continues to do something similar today. Are you going, by the way? Yes. <laughs> okay. So it's I'm a fun thing. The other it's thing a, that brought it to mind. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Brian. We really let you. <laughs> um, and so, um, not nearly on that level, but something far more easier for most of us. I'm going to recommend, if I haven't already, uh, a card game called Rook. When I was in college, and then years after, when I got to know a number of people at my church, um, and and had evenings to spend with them, we would play Rook. It's kind of like hearts. It's kind of like spades. It's you you, you deal out the deck. You there's four suits. There's a trump card. You you bid on points. You pick a trump. You pick a partner. I, the green. Uh, the thirteen of green is my partner. And then you go around in traditional card like fashion, mm-hmm. laying down cards and trying to win the hand. It's a lot of fun. It doesn't require a lot of concentration. You can talk about all sorts of things and have your sodas and your snacks there. <laughs> and uh, it can go on for hours. And it can get really silly as you try to bring each other down because, you know, <laughs> that. <laughs> so is it not played with a traditional deck of cards? No, and it, it's okay. not. You could play it with a traditional deck. But someplace it was invented. I haven't been told this. I do not know if it's true. I've been told that it was invented for those Christians who have a problem with the traditional deck. Okay. So it's just numbers, uh, one through fourteen, and a bird called the rook because <laughs> there's bird on the card, and mm-hmm. that could be a trump card, high, low, middle, whatever you want. But you know, there was a time when a lot of families in America uh, on an evening, Friday evening or Saturday evening, would get together with neighbors and they play cards. And it need not be a horrible waste of time. It can be a productive way of of developing fellowship. Um, it's not doesn't involve gambling, and it doesn't involve snacks. So <laughs> you know that's good. And you can begin to bring your your older children into it because they like to win. Nice. And, uh, anyway, I've never it, buddy. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. There's my recommendation. Thanks. Cool. I have a, something. Remind me to recommend sometime the book that will would not fly with Christians who don't like playing cards. But <laughs> it's a really fun book. Not a great book, but a fun book. Anyway, uh, thank you so much, both of you, for this conversation. It's been a delight. Thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband. Thank you to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. Uh, if you'd like to join their number, you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting towards Zion, or you can become a patron at patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. If you want to get a hold of us, the best way is to send us an email. It's halting towards Zion at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening. Hope you'll join us again next time. Bye.